welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 70. I'm Charlie Place and joining me today, back on the podcast, is the author of a book that takes the assassination of James I's favourite, George Villiers, and works out a fictional retelling of it, or a telling of it, weaving in elements of history. It's called The Honey and the Sting. Hello, Liz. Hello. It's good to have you back. It is. I often ask questions when people come on about the background, etc, etc. I've had you on before. It seems almost been there, done that, I suppose. But there was something that I have noted, and I think it's kind of been brewing through my readings of your books throughout the years. And I remember Sisters of Treason, I noted that it was set in really a couple of rooms, a little suite, and you really kept to that. And I really, really like that. And The Honey and the Sting, you have got a book that is 350 pages, you know, so it's it's not missing anything, but you have really stripped the story down. Anything that's even the slightest bit unnecessary is gone. You've just honed in on the plot and the characters completely. And I suppose I wonder if you could talk about that, your writing style here, uh, where your choices come from, etc. Yes, I mean, it's, it's really a, a very, very different book from my previous books. Simply, I suppose, because, one, it's not set in and around the court, and nearly all my other books certainly have scenes, scenes around the court. And actually, the first iteration of this was very, very different. And I had many more scenes in Whitehall, scenes in Westminster Palace. But actually, it wasn't really working. It was also that my three female protagonists didn't exist in my first draft. There was a single female protagonist who was the sister-in-law of Buckingham or George Villiers. And I really, really wanted to write about her, Frances Cook. Her story's amazing. She was forced into marriage with Buckingham's completely mad, I mean, mad enough to be incarcerated brother because she was an heiress. She was the heiress to Purbeck Island and it came with fantastic wealth and a title. And Villas, you know, he really, really wanted to accumulate titles and wealth for him and his family. And so he struck a deal with her rather unpleasant father and she was beaten, tied to a bedpost and beaten until she consented to the marriage. Then she tried to run away and all that. And I thought, I want to write that story. I want to write that story about her. And he also then hounded her, tried to have her tried for adultery whilst she was married to the mad brother. She got pregnant and the mad brother was incarcerated so that he assumed the child was not the brother's. And so he hounded her with this adultery accusation into this place, the hall in the forest. So that is the place that still exists. But I couldn't weave those two stories together I couldn't find a way to do it. I think I wrote three drafts and each time I had like long conversations with my editor and she just said, this isn't working in terms of the time scales of the two stories and the bits that were set at court where Frances Cook was for a large part of her life and her married life just didn't fit. So I just went right back to the drawing board and the character, the female character became three sisters who are completely fictional. So I've got the two main male characters who are Buckingham and Felton, who is basically a hired assassin who has some history with Buckingham. So the two men are based on real people. So I think that's why the book is so different in character because it's the escape of these women and they are then being hunted down. So it's a very different sort of book in terms of the plot. And I think that's what you're picking up on in, in that it feels different and it's it's a very, very different setting. And also the girls are not nobility. They are they are just ordinary women. They're the children of a of a rural doctor. Mm-hmm. I did just really like how straightforward I, I suppose carries on and it creates the page turner aspect as well. If we say before I ask a question, Liz, that the book looks at the events that possibly could have surrounded George Villiers' death, and you've got the name and profession of the real murderer weaving a story around him of a woman who, together with the sisters, is on the run from him because of what he's done to her and uh, the resulting child who he wants for himself. 
But yes, you have said about the sisters. Actually, I think if we get to your reading first, can we go to your reading first and then we will continue? Absolutely. Yes. So I'm going to read a little bit right from the beginning. It's the it's the first little excerpt. It's a kind of prologue, really, which sets the scene of the sisters when they are very young. And then we go forward in time after that. But this kind of gives you an idea of who they are. The girl appears to float in the low broom. Her skin is transparent, veins tick in her temples, mysterious as the workings of an opened clock. Oblivious to her sister watching from the fence, she gazes entranced at her hands, which are blanketed in something dark and moving. An anxious crevice forms between the sister's moth eyes. Instinct, a twist in her gut, tells her to bolt, to run back to the house and slam the door, to throw herself into the solid embrace of her father. She can imagine the rough wool kiss of his jacket against her cheek, the safe squeeze of his arms. But her father isn't there. He left before dawn with the groom to visit a patient. She had heard through a haze of half-sleep the hollow timpani of the horse's hooves on the cobbles. When he is absent, she feels a desperate emptiness, as if he might never return, and she will be left to care for her sisters alone, adrift in a world she does not yet fully comprehend. Her father's voice is in her head. Melissa's different. You must take special care of her, or she will be crushed by the world. She turns, almost expecting to see him close by, but there is nothing, just the snap and hum of insects in the crisp air. She shivers, calling to her sister. Melissa doesn't respond, is entirely bound into her own impenetrable universe. Hester girds herself, climbing over the fence, jumping down into the dew-drenched grass, the cold of it smacking her bare ankles. The wet soon clogs her canvas slippers, her hem absorbing it thirstily, making her skirts heavy as she approaches her floating sister. What in heaven's name? She can see now that Melissa's hands are encrusted with bees, a great agitating mass that obscures her skin, spilling down her wrists and up her sleeves. Without looking away from the swarm, Melissa whispers, I have their queen. She has a disturbing, feverish air about her, and Hester wishes she knew what to do. She feels the fast, hard thump of her heart. They knew of a child in Oxford once who'd fallen into a bee's nest and died of the stings. A few of the insects break away, vibrating close, as if to learn whether Hester is friend or foe, close enough for her to feel the disturbance of air against the skin of her face. She resists the temptation to bat them off, standing stock still until they leave. They sing to me, tell me secrets. Melissa transfers her stare momentarily towards Hester, who releases an involuntary gasp at the sight of her sister's horror-struck expression, the blackest secrets. You're imagining things. Hester does her best to muster her common sense, but her thumping chest is making her feel lightheaded. When Melissa looks back again, her expression is transformed, now serene. Watch this. She opens her fist. A small bullet flies out, disappearing into a bank of nettles. The swarm moves after it directly in a great dark cloud, leaving only a half a dozen confused malingerers on Melissa's white lap. The girls watch the bees depart in silence, and only once they have disappeared does Melissa inspect her open palm. She can sting as many times as she wants, see? She thrusts her hand towards Hester and survive. There are several angry looking welts, bright pink against the pale skin. But the workers die if they sting. They defend her with their lives. Hester doesn't know how to respond. Why such sacrifice? It must be something to do with there being only one queen in a hive. Did you know that, Hester? Just one queen? How do you know, Hester asks. They told me so. They? Who? The bees, of course. Her eyes widen, the pupils expanding, drops of treacle spreading on a plate. Come inside, Hester holds out her hand, please. She breathes into her cupped hands to warm them. You catch your death but Melissa's eyebrows ruffle like birds drawn by a child and her lids slide open. The tormented look has returned, causing unease to seep into Hester right to her core. Don't you want to know what the Queen said, what she showed me? Hester is tugging at her sister's hand now, 
But Melis shakes herself free. I saw father. What do you mean? But Melissa's crumpled, is scratching at her eyes and dissolving into strange, anguished sobs. Help me, Hesse, you must help me. They show me things I don't want to see. Hester slides down to take her tightly in her arms, rocking back and forth. Beneath her hands, Melissa feels insubstantial, breakable. You're safe. I am here. I won't let anything happen to you. The quiet is shattered with the hammer of approaching hooves, closer and closer. The girls huddle together. A vast shape vaults the orchard fence and comes to a halt, quivering and striated with foam, head tossing manically. It is their father's horse. Hester begins to unravel, but forces the frayed parts of herself together as she approaches the petrified animal. He backs away. Poseidon, here, boy, here. She makes a quiet clucking sound, waiting motionless for him to drop his head an inch towards her. Finally, he allows her to stroke his muzzle lightly and blows his hot, heavy breath into her hand. What's happened, boy? Melissa is still rocking back and forth, emitting a low moan, almost a song, almost a dirge. From the side of her eye, Hester notices the small form of their half-sister toddling towards the orchard gate. Stay there, Hope. She dashes towards the infant, foreboding rattling around her head like a dried pea in a pan. She picks Hope up, heaving her onto her hip, just as the groom clatters into the yard. He is running, calling to the girls and leading his own horse by the reins. Something heavy is slung over its back. Hester can see the boots she had polished the night before, hanging limply against the chestnut flanks. Hope, too young to understand, prods at their father. Wake up, Papa. Melissa's drawn beside her sisters and is staring, tears coursing silently down her face. Poseidon bolted, the groom is distraught his face ashen. Yadar fell, cracked his head. He rips off his cap. He's young, can't even grow a beard yet. It were quick. He wouldn't have known nothing about it, God rest his soul. He presses a hand to his heart. New distress breaks over Melissa's face, her voice cracking. I, I saw his head hit the ground. She twists her fists into her eyes as if to rub the vision out of them. Hope is understanding now that something is wrong, begins to howl. Hester can't speak, can't think, can't move. Her smallest sister is inconsolable in her arms. The other is raving, and she must keep the fragile edifice of their family from tumbling. Her every crevice crowds with dread. Thank you. Liz, you, you introduced the sisters and the reason that they are there, the, the way you went from Francis Cook to the fictional sisters. Could you talk more about their creation, uh, Hope, Hester and Melis, and so on and so on? Yes, well, they are. I mean, Melis was probably my starting point because there was a woman, oh, I wonder if I can remember her name, Eleanor, oh, I've forgotten her name now. Anyway, she was a kind of prophetess. Everyone thought she was mad and she predicted Buckingham's assassination. So I became really fascinated with her. And I kind of thought, okay, this is a really interesting story. And I wonder if I'm creating a fictional character, perhaps I can create someone who has visions. And in a sense, I sort of wanted to explore ideas around, around mental health, people who had things that we might call uh, depression or psychosis, or we, we have names for them now. They were just all considered completely mad. Melissa you know, she's, she's very, very fearful of everything. And she has sort of strange visions and she hears voices and believes them. And I was trying to characterize a schizophrenic type of individual. And I, I like the idea of the three sisters because they, they would kind of create a really, a really wonderful dynamic in terms of, you know, these young women having to take care of themselves. So when the the story begins, they are all living in a place near Oxford, a little house, managing to make a living, you know, taking in mending and a bit of embroidery and making honey and beeswax candles. And I, I like the idea of this small family industry that was completely female. Uh, so I wanted to sort of explore those ideas and 
and they have responsibility for their younger sister, Hope, who's only 16. She's very young and she's incredibly naive. And one or two people have sort of criticised me for making her so naive. But actually, I think she's young. She's had a really, really sheltered life. And she makes the most terrible mistakes because she's overly trusting. And Hope also, Hope's mother was a woman of colour. And I'd read Black Tudors, Miranda Kaufman's very, very good book. I really wanted to demonstrate this idea that she forwards that England wasn't a place that was uh, always just completely full of white faces, uh, that there was some diversity. So I had a whole backstory for Hope's mother that she had been the daughter of a pearl diver who'd come over. Pearl divers from the west of Africa were brought over to dive the wreck of the Mary Rose. I wanted to include all that. I wanted to show a picture of rural England that isn't necessarily the rural England we have in our minds. Mm -hmm. You said the criticism, but I mean, Hope's having her head turned, isn't she, by these men, which is going to happen when she's 16. Something obviously in the book, and also you have said about it with uh, Melissa. You have effectively, through her telling of the future, gone towards fantasy almost for the book, would you say? Well, I mean, I'm really, in some ways, sort of I border on the supernatural, but I like to think I've always got some firm, pragmatic explanation really for those supernatural elements bit like Charlotte Bronte, you know, everything's explained. In Villette, she thinks it's a ghost, it's not a ghost. It's not that there's always a pragmatic explanation. And I think that really the supernatural elements come through the eyes of the women rather than the the actual facts of the book. Mm -hmm. With the bees, can I ask you, you've got the honey and the sting, this whole concept around it. Can you talk about where that comes from, why you've used it, etc.? Oh, yes. Well, when I was writing this book, I was, was living in Norfolk in this very, very old cottage. And I started to hear this tapping noise in the walls. <gasps> yeah. In the, one of the bedroom walls. And it was just constant. And I didn't know what it was. At first, I thought it must be a rat or something. And... Um, it went on and on and on, and I got the pest control, and I was like, well, you know, what is going on here? And they said, ah, that's a wasp's nest. Mm. And I was really glad it wasn't a bee's nest, because that would have had to, you know, the wasp nest, you just smoke them out and they go elsewhere. Bee's nest has to be really carefully removed and everything. <laughs> but then I started looking up about, you know, bee's nests in houses, and it was just, uh, you know, a whole kind of diving into a, uh, bees nest internet hole for you for days and days and there's something really really interesting symbolically about about the bee and that idea that you know they all serve this queen you know I thought that was a really interesting symbolic thread to have running through you uh said about the wasps there yeah that, that was me a month ago actually tap 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 oh no oh, really so, yes yes had that here so yeah, you've got the sisters. We've talked about them, and I'm going to ask about Hope in a in a little bit. And I know you you said about not spoiling the story, and I think we can go without spoiling your story. But I think the history we can definitely talk about. So can you talk about George Villiers? How you've uh, included his story? How you've why you made the, the choices you did? Yeah, well, I was really really fascinated by the male royal favourites. And so the previous novel, The Poison Bed, was largely about Robert Carr, who was James I's, you know, one of his really long-term lovers who gained all sorts of riches and titles and he ended up in prison. And that's that story. It was a big scandal. And then, But then another big story was with Buckingham, who was possibly James's really greatest love and there are extraordinary love letters between the two of them but Buckingham was an incredibly clever political operator and as he saw that James obviously wasn't going to go on forever and royal favourites 
always disappear when a new regime comes into being. And he never really got on particularly well with the young Prince Charles, who was going to be Charles I. So what he did, he sort of went on a mission to woo Charles and become his kind of mentor, which he did very, very successfully. So he managed to um, to bridge the, the transfer of power and still be the royal favourite. He wasn't obviously the royal lover as some people believe he was James's lover. Some people shy away from actually naming it as such. He was probably the most powerful man in England. And that's certainly what people said of him. The king didn't do anything without his advice. And he, you know, he was just incredibly rich, swaggering, had the best of everything. And he had started to become really unpopular with the people. So whilst all the sort of aristocracy in the court fawned around him because he was so powerful and he had the ear of the king, he'd started some campaigns in France that were really unsuccessful and hundreds of thousands of soldiers died. All the rest of them, did, the ones that survived, didn't get paid. And they really, they all had it in for him. And then what happened was people close to him, there was a kind of sort of slightly odd magician-y type man who he was very close to. He was an elderly man who was literally torn apart in the street as a kind of warning to Buckingham that this is what could happen to you. And then he was assassinated. And there was a man called Felton who who killed him, killed him and then he was he was arrested and he was eventually beheaded. But um, there are various theories about Felton and who he was and why he did it. And, you know, a lot of people say he was a disaffected soldier. He had been overlooked for a promotion. But I, I weave a whole fictional story as to why that assassination happened. You know, we don't really know why it happened. So I feel there's space for fiction in there and to kind of explore ideas about revenge. It's really about revenge this book in largely and there is some sense that it's possible that him and Buckingham who was then just plain George Villas and they were of a similar rank they trained at a, a kind of military academy type place in northern France together so I I kind of make much of that and actually earlier drafts had lots and lots of early passages of their time training together. But that is a really, really important fact that I build my fiction around, that the two having known one another in their youth and that Felton, had his fate had gone sliding downwards. He'd been a sort of mercenary, a jobbing soldier, fighting in wars. He's, he's injured, his arms all suppurating. He's probably going to have it, have it amputated. And whereas... Villiers in the king's bed, he becomes master of horse, and then he's all these titles. He's the Duke of Buckingham. And, you know, their, their fates couldn't be further apart. Yeah, I, I've got a question on Felton in a minute, but I want to ask you, and I don't know, I, I think from what you said, it's kind of given me an idea that maybe your answer will be no, but here we go. Let's ask the question. Were James I and George Villiers lovers, would you say? Okay, well, in my opinion, yes, because, well, I think James had a series of really intimate favourites. The first was his sort of kind of old, old, much older cousin, and he was called Esme Stewart. And he kept Esme Stewart's heart in a box after he died for his whole life, in, in a heart-shaped box, I think. Then you've got Robert Carr, who is the subject of the poison bed. And there was a scandal in a court case to do with Robert Carr and his wife and a man who, who was murdered, Thomas Overbury. And there seems to be a situation in which James had everything hushed up. And I explore the idea that there was something incriminating for him around his sexuality that he didn't want to come out. We don't know that. We never know if people were lovers unless there are children out of that 
relationship or unless there's some kind of witness or no, there's very, very rarely a witness. But certainly there are letters between James and George Villas Buckingham where they are so deeply intimate, pet names for each other that are so affectionate. And there's talk about sharing a bed and my head bashing against the headboard. You know, it's pretty, for me, pretty conclusive. And I asked this question of several historians, proper historians. I, I don't consider myself a proper historian at all. <laughs> and, you know, one or two agreed with me and one or two kind of stopped short of really saying it because they say they can really only say it if they know it and if there's proof, if it's a matter of the record. And of course, it's not, not a matter of the record. So we just don't know, but I think much of the evidence points to it. And this, this series of very, very close male favourites. And, you know, he, he did have children with Anne of Denmark, his wife. But once there was the heir in the spare and they had completely separate households by then. And there's some evidence he didn't particularly like women. He surrounded himself with men. And yes, monarchs tended to do that. But... Yeah, it's it's my belief. I have to come down one side or the other, really, to write fiction, because I have to know who my character is. And that's the side I come down on through an interpretation of the record. Mm -hmm. It's uh, something we're maybe not going to learn. It's uh, easier to find kings in a car park, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got the use of Francis Bacon's book and in his words, his essay, I suppose you could say, in your book, in The Honey and the Sting. Could you talk about your decision to use his work and the whys and that sort of thing? Well, firstly, Francis Bacon was a man who preferred men. Um, and that is something that's quite well accepted. But also, I mean, he's an interesting figure. And I wanted him in because actually the title, The Honey and the Sting, comes from a piece of advice that Bacon gave to George Villiers, talking about being a ruler, that you have to employ both the honey and the sting. And it was actually a kind of starting point for the idea of the book that kind of grew out of this notion of both using, you know, the carrot and the stick. And so it, in a way, he's there because he gave me my title. And also that book is a, is a keepsake given from one man to the other. And, and it becomes a sort of important clue and all sorts of other things. But, but yes, Bacon gave me my title. Fair enough. Fair enough. And I'm going to cycle us back round to where you were talking about hope and black people being in, no, it's not Tudor Britain, is it? Stuart Britain. Uh, black people being in Stuart Britain and before if you can just kind of expand on this on f furthermore on your research and how you included it and, and so on. Well, there's a, a very famous painting of Anne of Denmark, who was James first wife. Uh, and she has a servant of quite high standing, black servant of quite high standing in this, in this picture. And there were lots, there were, I mean, not lots. I'm not saying that there were, you know, that the, the country was, highly populated with a hugely diverse population but there were people in England I mean Miranda Kaufman's book Black Tudors was really my starting point because she takes the endless endless town records and parish records she found a number of people from all over England who were living their lives they had their professions they weren't all prostitutes and slaves, none of them, they weren't enslaved. They were just people living freely. And I really wanted to bring that in because I felt it was something that would create a more accurate picture of uh, Stuart Britain. And, you know, Hope, a character like Hope could easily have existed. And I, you know, I feel it's important when historians find or, you know, revise history a little bit. I think it's important that as fiction writers, I feel it's important to create an image of rural Britain that, that includes that, that we 
allow that to become part of the, the you know the rich kind of knowledge we have of the period mm-hmm. well you said revised history there and I'm going to take that because we didn't know much about this it's only in recent years that uh, the fact that we've had black people in England maybe in Britain as a whole the, the countries that are now Britain has kind of come to the forefront and we're learning about it well I, th- I think every Every new generation looks at history differently. Mm. And now we're looking at at history through a lens in which we're seeking out hidden stories. I mean, we're looking for the stories of women and female voices from the period before when some historians, you know, David Starkey might have said, women never had anything of importance to say anyway, so there's no point looking for their stories. So we're looking for new voices. We're looking to see the stories that have been oppressed in some way by the versions of history we've chosen to look at. So and I think that diversity is one thing. And, you know, I think it, it just goes with, with the time. You know, we look at the past from the present and what happening in the present, it dictates what we're looking for in the record. So the record exists, but it's how you read it and how you look at it. And so, you know, these lives, they're buried in parish records. No one would have looked for them. You have to actually go specifically looking for them. You know, I think what Miranda Kaufman's done is is tremendously important. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's interesting as a historical subject in itself, why why it happened and how things have happened. When you were last on this podcast, you were mentioning about the adaptation of Queen's Gambit. And I know that has been in the mix for a few years now. And it has been made and you've got some great stars there. What can you tell us at this point about it? Yes, well, I can tell you that it's all been filmed. It's being edited as we speak and is not called Queen's Gambit for quite obvious reasons. One a very, very successful Netflix adaptation of another novel that was called The Queen's Gambit. Um, It's called Firebrand, and it will be starring Alicia Vikander and Jude Law. So they're always quite vague about things in the film industry, but the plan is it'll probably be out around this time next year. So that's all super exciting. And I've done a new edit of the novel, Queen's Gambit. It's not, I mean, if I don't change change the story of the novel at all but I've tidied it up the prose is cleaner given it a bit more space there are more chapters so it's it it feels less dense so it was really nice to revisit uh, my first novel and it will be published as Firebrand yeah I'm very very excited about that obviously and it's actually been filled and happened and I went to visit the set it was an incredible experience I went a couple of times and yeah, it's super exciting. So on this, are you looking towards a red carpet event for yourself? I will go to the premiere. And I don't think I will be walking the red carpet in a, in a gown or anything, but uh, the, the stars will be, <laughs> and I'll be there. And I'm thinking also, I'm perhaps going back to the Tudor Elizabethan period for another novel. Um, it's very, very much in its infancy. So kind of that process of revisiting Queen's Gambit or Firebrand has rejuvenated an old idea I had for another novel set in that period. So that's quite fun. But there is a novel coming out soon and it sounds like it's completely and utterly different from what you've done before. Can you tell us, I believe it's called Disobedient. It is called Disobedient and it is, it's very different. Well, you know, it's still a book by me. It's got all my my general themes. It focuses around a woman, a, a really extraordinary young woman, Artemisia Gentileschi. She is a painter. And the novel is set in 1611 and 1612 in Rome. So in that respect, it's completely different. Also, it's not set around the courts of rich people or people of influence, really, they're very much in the back of the background. It's really about this young painter who grows up in a painting household, her father's a painter, and she goes on to become 
well, the most celebrated female painter of that period, or, you know, the first woman who was accepted into the Accademia dell'Arte in Florence. Her work was judged alongside her male peers. She was absolutely treated as an equal. And my novel does not cover that part of her career, really, but it covers this year of her life when she's 17 and she creates two masterpieces. But she has an unbelievably turbulent and really year of devastation and really, really unbelievable challenges that somehow I feel kind of spurred one of the masterpieces and other things that make her the person she becomes. So that's that's what disobedient is. Okay, so this is another thriller as, as such, if I go by general categories, or is it more straight historical fiction? It's historical fiction, and it's, it's actually an Elizabeth Fremantle novel, not an E.C. Fremantle novel. So okay. that, that, that's what differentiates them. The, the E.C. Fremantle ones are the kind of, they're more thriller in, in tone, whereas this is really... I mean, it's certainly got some sort of page turny uh, aspects, but it's not a not a proper thriller, no. Okay, no, I mean that's exciting. Elizabeth Fremantle in in the guise of Elizabeth Fremantle is back. That's exciting. I'm looking forward to it. So, Liz, it has been lovely having you back on. You said yes when I asked. I was really, really excited. I was like, yes, she's coming back. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you very much for listening. Please do share this episode with anyone you think would be interested in it. The Wormhole Podcast, Episode 70, was recorded on the 19th of September and published on the 10th of October, 2022. Music and production by Charlie Place.